All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dese and I'm a PhD student, as Mark said, at the Institute for Molecular Bioscience at the University of Queensland. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to bore you about why we study venom. You all know it better than me, how they are remarkable features. They are valuable sources of compounds with potential applications for therapeutics and agriculture. But uh, most known toxins that we are aware of come from snakes and arachnids, while insects uh, and more specifically caterpillars also have uh, complex and interesting venoms. The specific thing about caterpillars is that they don't prey on anything, so they only use their venom for defense. Uh, and they are really underrepresented in venom research. If they have been studied, it was mostly because they were health hazards, uh, not usually as a source of therapeutics or for understanding their venom composition. Here are the two most studied caterpillars. The right one, Lonomia oblica, which you are probably familiar with if you've been to South America, uh, has been comprehensively studied uh, mostly due to its venom's lethal effect because can it can cause hemorrhagic syndrome and blood coagulation and eventually death. This is one caterpillar that can actually kill you. And the other one, the left one, Ocrogaster lunifer, is an Australian processionary caterpillar, uh, which can cause reactions in humans, of course, but more importantly, they can cause equine fetal loss syndrome in pregnant mares. So they are very important in veterinary. But there is another family uh, within Lepidopterans, uh, which is called Limacodid, that we even know less about. They are different from other caterpillars in their slug-like adhesions and movements. Uh, they, they can be found in all continents uh, in Asia, Africa, North and South America, and Australia. And they are really diverse. And some of them have these spines that can cause irritation. And they are called nettle caterpillars. So we haven't really studied nettle caterpillars, really. The first one was back in the 80s, which they just uh, divided the venom of uh, an Asian caterpillar, Parasa consocia, into low molecular weight fraction and high molecular weight fraction. And they've injected that to get these human volunteers. And they realized that both fractions can cause pain. And then there was another study back in the 80s as well that realized that histamines are the major components of the venoms. But the new study that has been published in 2021 that has been done by my supervisor, Andrew Walker, is the only one that used a transcriptomics and proteomics approach on an Australian Lyme code called, called Doratifera vulnerans uh, to see actually how they have this complex proteinaceous venom composition. They had 151 polypeptides grouped into 59 different families, and the majority of them were uh, adipokinetic corazonin-related peptides, which are kind of insect neuropeptides, and then secropin-like peptides, which are a part of innate immune system of insects. I'm going to talk about them a bit more now. And then ICKs, which are similar to the ones that dominate the spider venoms. So until now, we thought that because it, this is only a defensive venom, it can be simple. But we showed that it's not the case. They can also have a very complex venom composition. But we still don't know if what Dorotifera vulnerans has as its venom is something that is going to be communal among other caterpillars, because the studies on caterpillars has, been, has not been done very much. So there are some gaps in our knowledge. We don't know how venom peptides have evolved from the endogenous peptides, like secropene-like peptides. And we only know one Lymacodida species that has been studied to details to understand the composition of their venoms. So I'm going to try to see what is the case for other caterpillars. And also the function of majority of toxin families is unknown. So this is where my PhD comes in. My overall aim is to expand the knowledge on the structure, function, and evolution of uh, Lymacodid venom toxins and potentially find novel peptides that might be useful therapeutics. And today I'm going to just focus on these two parts, the first two.
Okay. Cecropenes, as you probably know, are a part of innate immune system of insects. They usually have antibacterial activity. They are linear cationic peptides. In Doratifera vulnerans, they are also responsible for the pain induced after envenomation of mammals. We uh, showed that both on DRG assays and in vivo in mice. And DV13, which was one of these peptides in Doratifera, has a very similar sequence to ancestral secropene of non-venomous lepidopterans. But the other two that are more dominant in the venom are from the same area of the genome, so they are definitely similar to DV13, but they have some difference in the features, and they are the ones that are causing pain. So we did a blast with these three peptides sacropene-like peptides from Doratifera vulnerans and from sacropenes from non-venomous species. And using multiple sequence alignment showed that they have some conserved features. For example, all the non-venomous ones and DV13, which is similar to ancestral sacropene, have this conserved proline as their 24th residues. And they all have cationic residues at the N-terminus and two sites near N-terminal have anionic residues. But DV11 and 12 don't have the proline and also don't have the amidation, and they show a charge asymmetry. They are positive on N terminus and negative on C terminus. So we hypothesize that secropene like venom peptides might have evolved from an antimicrobial ancestral protein and then have been recruited into venom as painful venom toxins during the evolution of venom use. And they might have keep, kept or lost their antimicrobial effects. So we decided to test that. To test that, we made some analogs with targeted mutations in the lab using solid phase peptide synthesis. In some of them, we took out the charge asymmetry. In some of them, we inserted the proline. Some of them took them out. In some of them, we neutralized the acidic residues or added the amidation just to see how each of these features would affect the activity of the sacropenes. So we thought that because DV11 and 12 that are causing pain might confer a binding preference for the eukaryotic-like membranes, like mammal-like membranes compared to the bacterial-like membrane. So to test this, we tested DV13 and DV12 and all the analogs in between both on POPC membrane and POPC POPG membrane. And we actually saw that uh, this is not the case. So all peptides have higher affinity for bacteria-like membrane still. And both DV11 and 12 showed a stronger binding to both membranes com compared to ancestral DV13. Also, we submitted this to COAD, which is our community for open antimicrobial drug discovery here at IMB, to see how they would act against different pathogens. And all of the secropene-like peptides were active against acinetobacter. Neutralizing acidic residues in DV11 and 12 reduced the activity of them against estafarius, but improved their activity against E. coli. In both peptides, replacing acidic residues with alanine increased the hemolytic activity on red blood cells. So it looks like they are getting uh, more selective towards the mammalian cells. We then did DRG assay to ass assess the ability of these peptides to induce nociceptions or pain. In this assay, you can measure intercellular calcium. Uh, as an indicator for neuronal activation that would occur during pain. And DV13 didn't show any activity, but DV12 would cause the cells to light up like Christmas tree. So again, you can see that they are getting a bit more uh, specialized to act against the mammalian cells. And after DRG, to get the same results quantitatively, uh, we ran some flipper assay. This is a flipper duplex assay which calcium influx, and uh, cell death assay. And as you can see, DV12 is still the most potent one with lowest EC50. And the same results can be seen in the cell death assay. So what does it mean? 
DV11 and DV12 show more tendency to disrupt human cells than the ancestral cell and ancestral light peptide DV13. And charge asymmetry and losing proline and amidation helps with cytolytic activity. And binding to membrane does not correspond directly to hemolytic or antibacterial activity. So I'm still trying to understand how they are interacting with membrane. So next I'm going to do some MD simulation to see how they would act differently when in the presence of membrane. Also, I said that we published a study uh, under our Tifra vulnerance, but we still don't know if uh, other caterpillars in different geotypes and morphotypes would have a different venom. So we chose two different candidates. Another Australian species called Comana monomorpha, which represents a different morphotype of Limacodid because they are heavily covered with venom scully over the entire dorsal and lateral surface, whereas the other two are not. And then Acaria stimula or saddleback caterpillar, which is native to Florida as a candidate from a different geotypes. And when we did, this is our standard protocol to do proteomics and transcriptomics. I took this from uh, another paper of my supervisor, Andrew Walker, that was published in 2020. And we do proteomics and transcriptomics and uh, I'm not gonna bother you with the details, but when we did that for the saddleback, you can see that even though it's geographically very far from the Artifera vulnerance, they are really similar in venom composition. So the majority of peptides in this caterpillar are ACPs, Secropin like peptides and ICKs, they have a slightly more Didel or family 9 peptides, which are again disulfide rich peptides that are usually between 10 to 12 kilodaltons, and they are also a part of the immune system of the insects. But the same results for Comana monomorpha, which is another caterpillar from the same state in Australia, from Queensland, was surprisingly different. Venom of this one. Uh, has so many big aerolyzing proteins and doesn't have any sacropenes, doesn't have any didels. And these results show that venom composition can vary widely between different species of Lymacoidae. And it might also suggest that morphotype might have a stronger effect on venom composition compared to geotype. So to summarize, uh, the vulnerance and saddleback are on different continents, but their venom is highly similar in composition. But the vulnerance and Comana monomorpha, which are uh, occurring in the same region in Australia and are more closely related to each other, have completely different venoms. So also what I'm doing is to characterize a structure and function of additional toxins. So uh, this is just a big table to show that I'm making a library of peptides uh, in the lab, uh, both recombinantly and synthetically. And after I've made them, I'm going to screen them against the range of ion channels and insecticidal assays to potentially find something cool. And after that, maybe characterize the 3D structure of them using NMR. So watch this space. I might come up with something cool. Um, yeah, I would like to thank my supervisors and everybody in the King Lab uh, who helped me with this project. Uh, this is the paper that I referred to a couple of times that was published in 2021 in PNAS, if you want to have a look. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to chat. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, any questions? As I have any, uh, some. <laughs> um, then I will start. So, can you go back to slide 12? Oh. Mm -hmm. You showed the several sequences of the peptides. Uh, yes. And do you know if the 
Uh, 3D structure is some helix at the beginning because it looked like with the positive chargers with the arginine and the lysine that it might be have a helix so that you have always a charge on one side that is known for several antimicrobial peptides or signal sequences for kind of um, processing that you have maybe a peptidase that would truncate mm -hmm. after the helix. Uh, that's actually a very good question. I did CD spectroscopy on them and used melitine as a positive control and they all act like melitine. So they are in random coil when they are in the presence of water, but when you put them in, next to a membrane mimicking uh, material like SDS, they all turn to alpha helix. Oh, okay. Yeah. Because I'm surprised that you have at the beginning this potential helix and then the C-terminal part looks more linear or not helical. And from some antimicropeptides, you have then in the middle some peptidase that would cut off the C-terminus from the A-terminus. Oh, that's really cool. I have um, to look into that. But yeah, uh, when they're not in the presence of membrane, they're all linear. Oh, okay. Yeah. And the other question that I had, what is FLIPR? What kind of assay uh, is this? Flipper is uh, uh, some kind of high throughput assay that you do in a 96 well plate. And it's like you can uh, usually test different ion channels or like mostly uh, cytotoxicity of the stuff uh, using that. And it's like, for this one, I've used the neuronal cells S, I always say that wrong, SHY5Y cells. Uh, and it's like, yeah, you can use the calcium um, influx assay to measure the cell death. Okay. Thank you. So, any further questions? I have one question, please. Yeah. yeah. So, it was uh, about the sample of uh, your venom. How did you extract the venom from these uh, species? I know that for snakes and scorpion, it's easy to get the venom, but from these species, I don't know if it's easy, like the corn snail, yeah, so, so it's very difficult to have also. So the approach is very different to snakes and arachnids. So they have this sponge that when uh, they are bothered, it's going to open up and uh, the venom is gonna be on the top of the spine. So what we do is like, we usually annoy them, piss them off. So they open the spine and then you put a paraffin on top of that and you collect the droplets of spine and then you wash the paraffin with millicule. Okay, it's take time to get this or not? It's take time to get the, a large, large amount of the, the venom or not? Uh, you can't usually get lots of venom, I would say. Uh, probably like one microliter per caterpillar. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. No. And Bea has a question. Yeah, hi, nice talk. Um, I was just curious if I missed it. Um, why did they have like produced this antibacterial or or it's just like random that you found like antibacterial activity and yeah, I have another question, maybe, maybe later. <laughs> okay, so they all have, uh, like all insects have this uh, antibacterial peptides as a part of their innate immune system. So this is supposed to protect them against bacterial infection. But in the ones that in the limacodids that are venomous, this immune peptides have been recruited into the venom and also act as painful venom toxins. So they are supposed to be in the venom, uh, in the caterpillar as, uh, you know, as an immune peptide. They are not supposed to cause pain. So that is why I was surprised that what are they doing in the venom? Yeah, I see. Cool. And while we're at the sequences, I was just wondering, would you know the abundance because it was interesting to see, like, was it 11 and 12 that were mostly toward, um, did you say mammalian and then the um, this ancestral-like peptide? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, actually that's a very good question. So DV11 and 12 are the more abundant ones. It looks like 
they are still producing DB13 for some reason, but mostly they have, you know, refunctionalized their immune peptide as the painful venom toxins. And I have the TPM numbers, like how abundant each of them are in the venom. I don't have it right now. I can probably talk to you later, but uh, DB11 and 12 are like the majority of sacropene lives in the venom. And then there is a tiny bit of DB13. I see. No, that works. At least now we know it seems like the 11 and 12 is more abundant and I guess it's using it for something else. Cool. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, definitely. Thank you.